Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 95 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. Before we get to this week's guest, Neil Sanderson from Three Days Grace, I want to remind you that you can get a Mistress Carrie backstage pass on Patreon. The backstage pass gives you backstage access to everything Mistress Carrie. There's monthly exclusive live streams, access to amazing free concert tickets, discount codes for shopping at mistresscarry.com, and you can even submit questions for upcoming podcast interviews. Click the Patreon link at mistresscarry.com or go straight to patreon.com slash mistresscarry. And while you're on the website, you can check out the events calendar. It's a pretty in-depth concert calendar for all of the shows happening in New England. And one of those shows is The Big Gig, which is happening April 30th at the DCU Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. The big gig was supposed to happen a couple years ago, damn you COVID, and it was supposed to be the 50th anniversary concert for my beloved radio station, WAF in Boston. Well, WAF may be gone, but the big gig is back on, and Godsmack, Three Days Grace, Black Veil Brides, Wage War, and Lilith Czar are all going to be there. There are still some tickets left available, and the link to get them is in the show notes of this podcast. And since the big gig is coming up, I thought this would be a perfect time to check in with Neil Sanderson, the drummer from Three Days Grace, and find out how he was faring towards the end of the COVID lockdown and how he was preparing to go back out on the road and to release the band's new album, Explosions, coming up on May 6th. It just so happens that I caught Neil Sanderson doing the most Canadian thing ever, riding around on a snowmobile tapping maple trees to make maple syrup. Neil and I talked about songwriting, his love affair with maple syrup, his love affair with the outdoors, touring, the fans, hockey, and his love of football, his disdain of daylight savings time, and a lot more. And a quick show note, this interview was recorded on St. Patrick's Day, long before the tragic recent passing of Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters. So allow me to introduce you to Neil Sanderson from Three Days Grace. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Now, I'm going to warn you the last time that I did an interview and the person was outside, it was Rob Caggiano from Volbeat. And the birds in his backyard wouldn't shut up. So where are you and why are you outside? Uh, Well, this is like the the first beautiful day. I live in Canada, so, you know, it's been a long winter, to say the least. And it's like beautiful today. I've got a I've got a place out in the country. I'm actually I tap maple trees. So I, I boil my own maple syrup. And uh, I am out here right now uh, emptying buckets of sap uh, to take back. I'm actually sitting on a snowmobile right now. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, just enjoying the weather. And um, just I got my son. I put my son to work over there and I'm just chilling out. First of all, we know you're from Canada because of the accent. We can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Second of all, I've never done an interview with someone on a snowmobile, and I've never done an interview with someone tapping maple trees. So good on you. This is a first. <laughs> yeah, it's that time of year. It's uh, I, I love it. It's well, just I love the fact that spring's coming. I'm a bit like I'm an outdoors guy. So give me a chance to be out here, and I am. 
it is a good time of year when you know the days are getting a little longer and you start actually feeling like winter might be over does canada do the daylight savings thing we do yeah so just the other day we had it so which is which is killer i don't understand why it needs to be dark at 4 30 p.m any time in the year so yeah it's nice to uh yeah i don't know just it's around the corner but i mean i don't know every time i as i get older the canadian winters i think that uh you know i I don't know why I don't live down south. <laughs> well, the we can't get our government to agree on anything, but for some reason they all agree on getting rid of daylight savings time, and it looks like it might actually happen. That might not be a bad idea. I, I like I like I like nine p.m. sunshine personally. There's your son in the background, like hi. Yeah. yeah hi. He- <laughs> <laughs> so this is how you prepare to release a new album and prepare to go out on the road. Maple syrup. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, lots of cardio. Um, yeah, there's, you know, gotta, gotta get my cardio game back. Just, you know, going from, uh, taking years off to, you know, uh, playing drums, 90 minute set, especially if it's like outside and it's really hot, uh, you can be in for a rude awakening. So yeah, just, um, you know, staying active and, uh, the band uh, starts rehearsing here in a few weeks. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty much go time. It's going to be, um, it's pretty wild to just, uh, you know, have the record in the can and have, you know, the, the couple songs out and the first single really people reacted well, really well to it. So it's an exciting time. Yeah. Well, it hit number one for the 16th time for the band. Congratulations. Thanks. It's a, it never gets old. It's, it's a pretty surreal feeling, you know, and it's, it, it really, we owe it to this, to the fans and everybody that supports us to, you know, we put a lot of heart and soul into it and to see it kind of surface at the level that it does is, is pretty amazing. You guys tied Shine Down for the most number one songs, and then they got another number one and hit seventeen. Do you guys just sit around and plot the violent death of the guys in Shine Down? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a you know, it's a whatever. Right? We don't get too caught up in numbers, but uh, yeah, we're coming after them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You brought up taking the last couple years off. Um, you know, one of the things that came out of it is the Mistress Carrie podcast because I had to find something to do while I was locked in the house. Tell me what your kind of COVID lockdown experience was like and then kind of how the band decided, like, this is what we're going to do during the time off. Um, well, you know, we had uh, we got lucky because we had toured so much in 2018 and 2019 that uh, we had planned on taking 2020 off from touring. So then when COVID happened, it was like, you know, the timing was actually kind of good that we hadn't really made too many plans. Um, and then, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with other artists stuff and I actually have a, 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 a new record label with producer Howard Benson that we've been, you know, we've made, actually made quite a few records and we kind of had a jump on being able to work collaboratively, like, you know, remotely and, uh, and, and not necessarily have to be in the same studio or in the same room to, to work together. And so, we had to jump on that. So it, it became natural for us to kind of just start writing a lot of the three days grace record, like over zoom and uh, you know, a combination of a few technologies. And so we were able to get a lot of work done like that, you know? And so we just never really stopped. Um, and, you know, the new record, a lot of it was, yeah, like, the, like I said, written remotely. And then, um, you know, some of the, the drums were recorded up here and then, you know, some, we kind of recorded in different spots at different times and just, just made it work. And it kind of gave the record its own sort of, uniqueness and it kind of has this level of aggression and freshness and maybe that's that's why it's just changing up the process the new album explosions is out on may 6th and there were a lot of bands bands like theory of a dead man bands like evanescence that had band members when covid hit in different countries Mm -hmm. and bands that were all in the same country at least could all get together and and work together if they all hunkered down and kind of quarantined together but when you're separated by borders and physically can't get together and forced to work by Zoom, how was that writing process for you? Did you enjoy it? Is it something you would do again? I like it actually because it's uh, you know you're kind of you're in the comfort of your own home and with the technologies that we kind of uh, combined, um, it you know as long as you had a good internet connection. Um, you know, whatever I was working on, I could stream it to everybody else. So if ever, so if someone else is in front of in front of studio speakers and I'm streaming sort of and we're on video conferencing, it kind of it just felt like you're in the same room. Like it's actually a little more efficient because like, you know, there's less smoke breaks and there's, you know, <laughs> there's less 
hey, let's go for sushi. You know, so it's so we got a lot, a lot done. But, uh, you know, when we when it came time to wrap it all up, it was, was really important for us to be in the same room together and kind of get that vibe and and really be a band and, and stuff. So, um, yeah, I you know, I continue to do it uh, even now, um, uh, you know, a collaborative writing remotely i think that's it probably set it you know it set the tone for not just music for i think a lot of collaboration and business and everything that people realize that you, it is possible you don't necessarily have to be sitting across from each other don't skirt over the massive name you just dropped like an anvil howard benson who is a massive name in music is that project what you've been working on in nashville um, yeah, a combination of well, mainly Los Angeles, um, but uh, you know we've um, uh, we're, we've got a company called Judge and Jury Records, and we're doing some stuff. You know, uh, we're doing some stuff with Star Set right now, and uh, you know we did uh, you know some of the Three Days Grace stuff with remixes, and uh, we you know we've we did uh, the last album for Diamante, and yeah, yeah, we have, we've got a lot of like young bands that we're working with right now, and just uh, yeah, it keeps us really busy, and and uh, you know, it's kind of fulfills what I want to do all day, which is make music. Didn't you get the memo that Rock's dead? Uh, no, I, I didn't at all. When it, when you go up on stage and you play in front of fifteen thousand people that are going crazy, you, uh, you realize it certainly isn't. I loved the tribute that you guys put up on social media to the people of Ukraine. You know, rock bands have such rabid fans around the world, and you guys are constantly touring. As fans, it's a big deal just when you come to our hometown, but sometimes people forget you guys are gone 200 and something days a year. And so when you're watching what's happening in the news, it would be easy to forget that artists like Three Days Grace have made fans and friends all around the world. And I thought your tribute to Ukraine was really touching and beautiful. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, it's uh, it's it's crazy what's going on over there, and yeah, you know, um, I guess maybe, yeah, it, I guess it hits closer to home when when there are places that you you know you've been to and you've you've met people and you've made friends and things like that. But you know, there's kind of stuff like that going all over the world, going on all over the world, and uh, you know, and I think you know, um, having traveled so much and toured for 20 years, you kind of just it's a reminder that sort of people are kind of the same everywhere all over the world. So just because it's happening on the other side of the globe doesn't mean it's real it doesn't make it less less real and it's like kind of it kind of hits you when um yeah when just you know uh people's lives change in the blink of an eye you got your son working with you tapping these maple trees i keep seeing him walk behind you and it looks like he's wearing a concert shirt does he share your love of rock music did you gift him that um yeah he yeah he likes he he's like he likes Imagine Dragons and uh, you know but he does come he's been to so many Three Days Grace concerts over the years and uh, yeah he's he's definitely very artistic um, and uh, you know he likes to rock on my drums and stuff like that but uh, he was actually in a he was actually in a drum commercial with me when he was younger uh, a Yamaha drum commercial he morphs into me uh, so and ever since then he's he's actually focusing on on acting as well I know that you started music really really young and had actually started putting the foundation of three days grace together in high school did your parents gift you the love of rock and roll where did it come from um it was a teacher that i had like uh his like my school teacher his wife was my piano teacher i just started playing piano when i was really young i got an organ from a garage sale and i'd found pretty quickly that i could play by ear and uh and so we had um you know, we had uh, like, you know, uh, we went to a school that was had a great music program. And, you know, once a week uh, I would stay after school because I'd get a ride to my piano lesson for my for my teacher. And that hour after school, he would just let me like experiment in the music room on anything that I wanted. So, you know, I'd practice my piano, but then the drums were there and I was always attracted to that. And, um, you know, I taught myself how to play the trumpet. And <laughs> so I just kind of had that time and then the piano lessons and you know, as soon as, as soon as I hit grade nine, I knew that I wanted to like form a band. That's what I really wanted to do. So that was like priority. Number one was, you know, getting to high school and, and, you know, finding that band and that's, and you know, that's this band. I, I you know, I've basically been in this band since I was 14. I have a theory about music that you get gifted music, whatever genre or whatever it is from how you grow up, your parents, older brothers, sisters, the cool uncle. And then there comes an artist, a song, an album that that you go, oh, hold on, this one's mine. 
So what was the soundtrack of your childhood? What music do you remember growing up? And then who was that artist? What was that song that you were like, wait a second, this is mine. This is what I like. Definitely Welcome to the Jungle, I think. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. GNR, when Appetite came out, that was it for me. I was like, what is this? this? It was just different. It was more modern than like a lot of the hair metal that was going on at the time. And it just kept, came out of nowhere. And that was definitely, when I heard that, I was like, "That this is it, yeah. So what do you remember listening to growing up at all? Like, what were your parents playing in the house when you were a kid? Uh, it was a lot of country, actually. Uh, a lot of country growing up. But, uh, but my brother, you know, was super into Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and Black Sabbath. And so that was, you know, when I heard Led Zeppelin, I knew that, you know, there was just some, something special about the drum sounds and the, on those records. And it turns out it was because of obviously John Bonham was like no other. And uh, yeah, so just Zeppelin and Sabbath, I think. And that's kind of, I think Black Sabbath is kind of why I really like, you know, sludgy hard rock and, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, just, just like darker uh, sludge rock. I'm, I'm, I've just always been into that. And then, you know, I think for me, uh, as I got a little older, um, Tool really, Tool really started becoming the band that I was, you know, pretty much worshiping. Well, between Bonham and Danny Carey, like your bar's pretty high for amazing, iconic, and sizable drummers. Like a certain amount of power. Those guys weren't small. No, no, exactly. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I like hitting. Yeah, I like you know, I'm a, I'm a hard hitter behind the drums, and you know, I think that uh, yeah, the power behind it and and the backbeat and. And finding the pocket and making people want to dance. That's what it's all about, right? I had a really interesting conversation with Mike Mangini from Dream Theater, who I've known for a long time. And when I interviewed him, he was sitting behind the drums because I I needed him to kind of explain things to me. The way that he thinks as he's playing the drums, because obviously drums, it's all math, right? Were you a math kid growing up? Were you good at math? Yeah, I was a math, math and science for sure. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a lot of coordination and just understanding timing and um, moving around the beat. And uh, and and also with drumming, it's kind of knowing when to stay out of the way of the other instruments, too. You know, that's as, the negative space is just as important as what you play. What's going through your head, though? Like, are you thinking like, you know, there's a thing like synesthesia where, you know, you you hear things as colors that I found out about that I had no idea was even a thing like when you're playing the drums, whether it be live or, or recording in the studio, is it math that's going through your head? Are you seeing the notes? Is it all feel like what's going on? Uh, it's a lot of muscle memory, a lot of muscle memory. So you kind of need to, you know, it's sort of like having a big bag of tricks and you can pull from that bag of tricks, whatever you want. And you, but you, the key is, is trying to be able to pull it out without really, you know, consciously thinking I'm going to play this now. It's, it just, your body sort of just remembers, uh, you know, that you've got this amount of time to do what you want around the song and being able to do it without really thinking about it, I think is, is where you want to get to where I want to get to anyways. Um, but that takes a while, you know, it's, it's, and it takes a lot of just practicing at home because everything kind of has a rudiment and, and a, and a technique that you really, at first, when you start learning something, maybe it's something that's a little more complex. Um, it feels really weird. <laughs> it feels really strange and awkward. Um, but then you'll find like, if you just stick at it a couple weeks later, what felt really awkward and weird, you don't even have to think about it. You just sit down and do it. Um, and so, so drumming for me is like that a lot, which, and it feels really good when you master something that's complex that you just can do without thinking about it and, and put and make it musical. Recently, I interviewed uh, Ann Wilson and interviewed Nancy Wilson months before. And, you know, the streets are paved with horror stories of siblings and bands. Three Days Grace has siblings. Uh, how does how does that how does that work? Is is there this brother thing that you have to deal with a lot or is there no drama there? Uh, no, they're they're they've pretty well figured it out. You know, they're <laughs> uh, they're nice, nice people and uh, they don't really get each in each other under each other's skin so much, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, they're de- definitely different personalities. You know, Brad's kind of the mom in the band, I guess, uh, you know, and um yeah, but everybody takes their job really seriously. And, you know, um, it's a lot of, 
yeah, yeah. Just, so, you know, you got to keep the train on the tracks and especially if you're in a group, it's like any other relationship, you're going to see the best and the worst of everybody, you know? And so it's how you react to that um, or not react to it. This just whether you can keep the train on the tracks. I ask this question a lot and I've always gotten the same answer. Is it harder to keep a band together or a marriage together? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it depends on who you're married to and who you're in a band with, I suppose. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about WAF, obviously, because you're playing a show at the end of April, the big gig that's gotten postponed a couple times. Originally, that was supposed to be a celebration of my beloved WAF in Boston and its 50th anniversary. And right before COVID, the station sold the signal and AAF went off the air. And now the big gig is turning out to be, you know, a two year farewell party. Um, mm-hmm. What memories do you have of like the early days of three days grace with AAF? Oh man. Well, some of the, some of the earliest, you know, shows, I think the first, um, our first American tour was with trapped and smile, empty soul. And that's kind of the, the, that's where we sort of, uh, started in that kind of neck of the woods, uh, south of the border. And I just remember like there be such, being such like a rock centric, you know, we were in the, st- you know, we're a Canadian band coming down to the States, didn't know what to expect. And just the rock scene was just so alive and pumping and so much history, you know what I mean? And it's like, and that, you know, that really, um, that really kind of is, is an homage to the station really kind of keeping, keeping the, energy alive and fans engaged and loving music and enjoying rock. And then, you know, it all culminates at a, at a wicked live show, you know? Uh, I have to ask you this question. I can't wait to hear your answer because I know you're such a songwriter and you work with so many other artists. It's a songwriting question. So it's not a favorite song question. It's a songwriting question. Give me an example or two of a song you think is perfect as far as songwriting goes and the craft of songwriting and that it's so good. You wish you wrote it, but tell me why. Uh, I think Peter Gabriel in your eyes. Oh, I love that song. I just think that that, uh, you know, there's so much emotion and it sounds great and his voice is the best. And um, it's got just so many parts it's like part after part after part each part is its own like is good enough to be a chorus in any other song but it's just the build up it's just i I believe in uh you know tension and release and songs and uh you know that that to me is like just the the perfect uh, representation of that it's one of my favorite lyrics of all time the resolution of all my fruitless searches i love that line absolutely yeah it's it's uh, one of my favorite songs for sure um, and before I let you go, you're in Canada, you're in the woods on a snowmobile tapping maple trees. It doesn't get any more Canadian than that. Uh, yeah. Every time I see you, we end up talking hockey. So talk to me, talk to me about hockey. What's going on? Um, well, you know, uh, the Leafs are on fire. Um, my son and I, my son's name is Jet. And so by default, his favorite team is the Winnipeg are the Winnipeg Jets. Um, so he and I are going to a hockey game, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs against the Jets here in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't know. It'll be a little late in the season to bring our hockey equipment on, on tour. Sometimes we bring our skates to see if we can, you know, get on the ice whenever we can. But, uh, you know, to be completely honest, I'm, I'm more of an NFL fan these days. Like I'm a huge Packers fan and we just got, we just signed Rogers up again. So, uh, you know, I try to go to a couple Packers games a year and that, but. Do you lose your Canadian citizenship when you become more of a fan of the NFL than the NHL? Uh, not as of yet, but the Canadian government, you never know what happens. And Rogers <laughs> got what, like 50 million a year or something. It's kind of insane. Yeah. He's, uh, he's pretty set up. He's pretty set up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, how do you think the Bruins are going to do? Oh, you know, I, I have a thing. I don't want to talk. I don't want to get in with the Bruins, but, uh, <laughs> no, I just, you know, I, I don't really respect Brad Marchand to tell you the truth. Gotcha. I think he, and I don't think he's a very classy player, but uh, well, they but don't call having, him the rat for nothing. Having said that, if he was on my team, I'd think I'd be more of a fan. I guess because he's, he's a great player. He's just, I just think there's an etiquette and there's a class in hockey that mo- most players should try and strive to live up to. Well, if you're going to be an, an NFL fan, then tell me about post Brady Patriots. 
Now that we all heard he's coming back and going back to Tampa. It was actually because we're we're recording this on St. Patrick's Day. And it was this mm-hmm. day a couple years ago that he announced officially that it was leaving. So, like, this is the two-year anniversary of all of us getting a dagger to the heart. Yeah. Well, you know what? I have a theory. I think that it's uh, – um, I think it has to do with – have you seen his boat that he bought when he went to Tampa? Have you seen his yacht? No. That's why he's in Tampa. Because, like <laughs> – if I could have a boat like that, I'd play for a, a, a I'd play for a Florida team too. So I wouldn't take it too personally. I think it's all about the boat. <laughs> That's it. It's just the boat. I mean, we have boats, duck boats. He's been on them six times. He should love the damn things. Yeah, yeah. No, his is more like a. It looks like a, it's like a yacht from space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that why you yeah. talk about moving down south because you want to have a yacht from space too? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I just wish I could. Throw a football. <laughs> There's not a lot of maple trees down there to tap, though, so you got to choose what you love, man. I know, I know. The boating is a little more expensive, too. Well, tickets are on sale for the big gig. I'm going to see you at the end of April. Um, I'm assuming that even though the record won't be out, we're going to hear some of the new tracks from Explosions on stage that night. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we're looking forward to playing some new stuff, and uh, we've got a lot of uh, intense new material and some really heavy stuff, and can't wait to just like you know turn that into electricity and just push the energy out into the crowd well thank you for all the love over the years i'm really excited that you guys are going to be there to kind of you know it's been it was really hard aaf going off the air and leaving this giant hole in new england when it came to rock and not being able to mourn it publicly because then covid hit right after there are people that say that aaf going off the air is what triggered the global apocalypse so (laughs) To finally be able to kind of get all of those AAF fans together, the show's headlined by local heroes, Godsmack. And so to be able to kind of get everybody together and celebrate the 50-year legacy of AAF, I'm really glad you guys are going to be part of it. Oh, us too. It's going to to be great. It's going to be a wild show and can't wait to see everybody. Well, tell the guys I said hi. Good luck with your trees. Thank you for the time and uh, enjoy the beautiful sunny day in Canada on your snowmobile. I will do. Take care. See you soon. There he is, Neil Sanderson from Three Days Grace. Their new album, Explosions, comes out on May 6th. And if you want to see him live, click the link in the show notes of this podcast to get tickets to the big gig coming April 30th to the DCU Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to hit subscribe and follow the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, if you subscribe and follow, you get the sit rep. The Situation Report comes out every weekday, and it's all your rock news, music headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. While you're checking out the show notes, there's also a link for this episode's corresponding playlist. Every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast gets a corresponding playlist, so you can easily find all of the music that we talked about in this interview. Huge thanks once again to everyone with a Mistress Carrie backstage pass. And if you're looking to have a cocktail with me, you can do it live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern on Cocktails in the War Room on my Facebook page. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.